with the baby. I, I, that's where all, that's where I have to talk about your big picture. Oh dear, my Zoom, I got a Zoom meeting that's starting. I can see. I certainly do have a Zoom meeting, whoever that is. Anyway, good. <laughs> but I think I'm, I'm on the road. Um, yes. Hello, everyone. Everybody. Hello, everyone. I see an awful lot of people I know, which I just love. Welcome to Après Midi. I'd love for you to put your video on, at least so we can see you and you can say hello. So while we're while we're coming in, okay, you are welcome to unmic. You are welcome to say hello, tell us where you are, um, and let's have a free for all, okay? Wow, South Florida. Cherry Hill, New Jersey. All right. Delaware. PA. Prince, Florence, Massachusetts. Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon. Leslie, are you in Italy? Leslie, are you in Italy or in the Seattle? I've been here a week. All right. Okay. Hi, Who Adrian. else? Where else are you? Wayne, Michigan. France. France. Toronto, Canada. Wow. You know, I think we have way France. more people. We have San people from Arizona outside of France. <laughs> Phoenix, Arizona. Scottsdale, Arizona. Our, I was just there. I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ranch, Arizona. From Mel, California. Greensboro, North Carolina. Oh, now you're supposed to say that Greensboro, North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> I lived in Maryland for a long time, so it's it's back and forth. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, I you met a friend from Greensboro. Um, yeah, look at everybody coming in. But not everybody has your camera on. If you're so inclined, say Adrian. Hello. Adrian, I tried to send a, a question for uh, Harriet, but it didn't go through. So should I just ask when she comes on? Of course. Okay, merci beaucoup. Okay, so the way this is gonna work, okay, is you know you have a couple of different views. You can view speaker view or um, gallery view. I have mine set to gallery view so that I can see all of you. We now have 85 people on, which is amazing. Um, yeah, incredible. And, and growing by the moment, I can see. And just so you know, we are recording this. And we will make the recording available so that you can watch it if you'd like. Um, but everyone else out there is going to maybe want to watch it too. So we're going to make it available. And um, what the, this is going to work is we're having a little bit of a, you know, a hello free for all like we would if we were at the cafe, you know, for all of you who have been to the uh, uh, Cafe de la Marie, where we usually hold our après-midi, we always allow everybody to schmooze for a while, say hello, um, get to know each other, get a drink. I don't know if you guys have your drinks yet or not. But, um, yeah. and, <laughs> and, Where is it? And then Where's the <laughs> You have, you got, have you got, who's got, who's, show me your wine. Who's got your wine, okay. Uh, um, 12 o'clock. Give me these, yeah? What's that? That's what's up. So, and then um, after we take pictures, the speaker comes on and talks for a while. And there's a Q&A, which is what we're going to do today with Harriet Welty Rogers before. I will right. introduce in a few minutes. And then um, after she's done, we can have a free-for-all again. So, um, I do, what you could do is you could write your questions in the chat box and Patty, where's Patty? Patty, where, where's Patty? I lost her. Somewhere here. Um, She's right next Patty, to you. Well, not on my screen. Okay. <laughs> you do, there she is, there she is. Uh, Patty's muted, so we can't hear from her, but um, Patty's going to monitor the questions, but also 
what will happen is we're going to ask you at that time to unmute okay. to yeah. unmute yourself so that you can actually ask the question and we like doing that so that we kind of feel like we're actually here <laughs> so we can participate and have some interaction and not just feel like we're sitting in our living rooms talking to all of you guys you know <laughs> um so I want to just welcome everyone to APD. Uh, it is, I'm going to just tell you this, it is no longer Parler Paris Après Midi because of the new social media outlet like Facebook that is very right wing called parlor.com. You guys know about um, this? Yeah. Yeah. So they have encroached on my name for the <laughs> that has been around since 1998. So unfortunately, we are no longer parlay anything. Uh, so we're are now they going just... to pay you. <laughs> I, wish... Nah. <laughs> I wish I hey, I wish I had enough um, uh, Boku okay. bucks to hire lawyers and sue them, but yeah. I don't think so. Don't think that's going to happen. I bet you could get yeah. a lot of uh, help from some lawyers on the left. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, okay. Anybody want to try? Be my guest. <laughs> um, that that's just all I need is to have that aggravation. But anyway, so um, it's it's finally come to pass that it's just après midi. And um, if you guys are ready, I know you don't want to hear you know all of this bull. You'd much rather hear from Harriet Welty Rose. It does not say that. What it, what it shows on my screen is a rectangle. Who's talking? Yeah. Who's talking? Okay, so here's what's going to happen. When I introduce Harriet, you might want to go ahead and mute yourselves because we actually hear everything in the background, you know? So go yeah. ahead and mute yourselves oh, now. And um, I'd like to introduce Miss Harriet Welty Rochefort, who, uh, Harriet, didn't we figure out we've known each other since 1998 or six? Uh, I thought it was seven. <laughs> 90, okay, so 1997. <laughs> Whatever. Um, I, I met Harriet. I met Harriet when uh, I was a volunteer at Weiss, which is an Anglophone organization that's been here for many years. And the, I was the public relations director. Okay, they gave me this job. And as PR director, I had the most fun because... I could go out and court all the journalists and the writers and the people who were really, you know, the movers and shakers in town. And Harriet was one of those people. So if you guys saw yesterday's uh, Nouvelle Lettre, where I talked about having met Polly Platt, who wrote French or Faux, and then Harriet's book came out shortly after that, uh, French Toast. And uh, then she wrote two more wonderful cultural books called French Fried and Joie de Vivre. And I actually helped Harriet name French Fried. I don't know if you remember that over lunch, we were talking about names for your book. That's right, that's, that's right. That's right, uh-huh. Oh and now the Harriet who um, is an author and a speaker and a freelance journalist and the, a former professor of okay. journalism at the Institut d'études politiques de Paris yeah. or Sciences Po yeah. um, has been I living in France for my awfully mic long time. So I can talk to you and they not hear me. Charity, I think you need to mute. <laughs> um, uh, Harriet, well, she's gonna tell her story, I'm sure. You're gonna tell your story a little bit, Harriet? And yeah. have you met Philippe? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Do you have a like four hours? <laughs> no. Um, uh, so Harriet met a Frenchman. So she'll tell you a little bit about that. Philippe got married, has lived here happily uh, ever after and wrote these fabulous books. And then she's really digressed from her usual cultural books because now she has written a, an historical novel called Final Transgression. And I hope a lot of you have already read it. I have already read it, of course. Um, and it's, uh, it's an amazing book and quite a, as I said, a digression from her usual uh, cultural mode. With, so she's today gonna talk about that book, not about the cultural side of things, but about Final Transgression. And she's gonna read some excerpts. 
and I'm going to let Harriet uh, take over. So there, okay. go for it. Okay, thank you, Adrian. And um, I want to really thank Adrian for her uh, wonderful skills and um, and for setting this up as skillfully as she always does everything. And to be with all of you today, I see there's 106 people on here, which is wow, quite a number. Mazel tov. You're real, thank you. <laughs> what am I supposed to say to that? <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. That's great. Uh, we, we hit the over 100 mark. <laughs> great, that's great. So yes, yeah, so uh, Adrian and I have known each other for a long time and I've spoken at uh, three other of her occasions on my three other books. So this will be number four speaking opportunity. You've spoken, you've spoken at my events many, uh, many oh, times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have many times. And, uh, Can everybody hear Harriet? Because I think for me, her volume's a little low. Fine. Everybody okay? It's as up as far as it can go. Can you okay. all hear me? Okay. So, okay. and please, okay. um, please everybody mute yourselves, okay? Okay. Yeah. So anyway, um, so thank you so much and thank you, Adrian, and also Patty for setting this up for me. It's really nice, I'm glad to be here. And I'm gonna tell you about my uh, new book, Final Transgression, but first I will uh, tell you how I got here in case you don't know the details. And my husband is sitting right in the same room with me. You can't uh -oh. see him. Uh-oh, so I have to be careful about what I say. <laughs> no, I just always wanted to come to France. So uh, when I graduated from college, I bought a one-way ticket to, to uh, Paris. And I stayed in a pension de famille with only French kids, which is a really good way to learn French, I must tell you. And uh, I stayed on for a year and I found a job because in those days you could find jobs. And then I decided to go back to the States for a year of master's in uh, journalism because I decided I wanted to be a journalist because the person I worked for in Paris was a journalist. So he inspired me and I did go back to journalism school. And when I graduated from journalism school, um, I decided I'd come back to France one more time and that would be it. So I, I jumped on a freighter that took me down the coast of California and to Mexico and then I went over to Veracruz and then I went to uh, Colombia and the Canary Islands and Spain and Morocco and back to Spain and up to France, get to France. Go, I went, oh, been there, done that. I'm gonna go to Argentina. But before I left for Argentina, this, uh, mutual, this friend of, of uh, mine said, Oh, listen, before you leave, I'd just like to introduce you to a friend of mine and, you know, and then we'll say goodbye tomorrow. So, okay, okay. So I went to the cafe. The cafe, by the way, was Le Select on Boulevard Montparnasse. You all know that cafe, probably. The famous cafe where Hemingway and uh, all those people hung out. Uh, and it's closed at the moment. I know. Isn't it sad? Oh, my heavens. So sad, all these cafes closing, tragedy. Well, anyway, so we, uh, there he's sitting on the terrace of the select and he's really, he's good looking. And I said, oh, not bad. And we start talking and I noticed something about him that really struck me. Well, as you see from looking at me, I'm a rather smiley person. I'm the kind of person, you know, people come up in the street and they ask directions to and stuff. Well, he had an expression on his face that was like that. <laughs> And I, said, and I said, oh my goodness, this is going to last about 10 minutes max and I'm out of here. <laughs> and so we start talking and he is saying the funniest things, but with that expression and the combination of it just killed me. So um, I decided to put off my trip to Argentina for a little bit. And uh, now it's been 50 years. That was my husband I met on the terrace of the select. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Harry. One meeting and you put off your trip to Argentina? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I did. Love, now I love got, it. There's, right. Wait, there's another part of the story. I have to, I can confess to you now because he's gone out of the room. Uh, the person <laughs> who, 
the person who introduced us was a boyfriend of mine who was trying to get rid of me. <laughs> and that I didn't know. <laughs> he must know that by now, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> he knows that. <laughs> so anyway, that's the long story short of how I got to uh, Paris and uh, why I stayed. Um, and then uh, life went on and I started having children and jobs and all the rest. And then one day after I had uh, been writing lots of articles for lots of people and I'd been a stringer in the Paris Bureau of Time Magazine for about 10 years and I was heading towards 50 and I said, oh my goodness, um, I'm not gonna be the world's oldest stringer at Time Magazine. I mean, this is pathetic. So I'm gonna write books. And anyway, I feel like writing what I want to say rather than what somebody else wants me to say. So I wrote those three books and I had a great time doing it. It was really fun. It was very cathartic. And I tell you, if you ever have problems with stuff, like I had a problem with the French at that time, you know, I was like, oh God, I think I'll just go back to the States. I'm sick and tired of dealing with this and that and the other. And I don't understand this and that still. And so I wrote it all down into what became the book. And it was so cathartic because afterwards I realized that the problems I had with the French were my problems, not the problems, not the French. It was me with the French. So it was really revelatory. And uh, that was a great experience. Um, so see, I've got some content here. Oh, okay. Um, so something strange happened to my Zoom mine too it says you are sharing device audio and now i'm frozen i now i'm frozen i'm viewing karen sinky's screen okay ah. we're back okay okay we're back. i don't know what happened but we're back anyway so here we are um so um i thought uh, i don't know if you can have a show of hands or something but how many people here have actually uh, read this book I'm going to talk about tonight, Final Transgression? Well, you can, there's a reactions thing that they can actually uh, press at the bottom right. Reaction thing, yeah. They can put a thumbs up. Right. Okay, and it, oh, you see it, it puts it on the screen so you can see it. I see it. Mm -hmm. I read it, it twice. The reactions, right. Okay. Um, the, the reason I ask is because I don't, <laughs> I don't, somebody put on a, that's cute. I put that's on me. a, oh, that's you. Thank you. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to uh, do spoilers. So I'm going to talk around my book a little bit. I'm not going to tell you the ending in case you haven't read it. That would really be too bad, you know, but yeah, I, don't, yeah, don't give away the ending. No, I'm, I'm not, I'm, oh. I'm not going to spoil <laughs> this experience for you. <laughs> but um, I, what I want to do is tell you the story behind the story, because I think that's what's going to interest people. Do you, you want know, me to start the PowerPoint? Um, not right yet. Okay, I'll you just say a few, Yeah, I'll just say a few remarks, and then I'll yeah. tell you that when it'll be a good time. Okay, okay, the story behind the story is something that happened in, to a relative of my husband's uh, mother. In fact, it was her sister during World War II, at the end of World War II. And it was a true story. And um, I stumbled on this story uh, one day when I was out at the country house and I went in uh, her bedroom and I saw on the mantel a picture I'd never seen before of this beautiful woman uh, in 1940s attire. And so I said to her, oh, who is that woman? I've never seen her before. And she said, well, that was my sister. And I said, oh. I said, well, what happened to her? And she said, well, she died during the war. And that was all she said. And you have to know my mother-in-law to appreciate this story because she was a woman who just loved to talk. She was the queen of the shaggy dog stories. And you can't imagine her ever being so um, pithy. And I said, oh, there's something she's, there's something more to this story than that. So uh, I said to Philippe, what do you know about your aunt? And he said, well, not that much, really. And I said, well, do you mind if I investigate? And he said, uh, no, I'll even help you investigate. 
And that was the beginning of the research, so, uh, the research into the book called Final Transgression. So uh, we, we uh, kind of traced the path of the aunt from the small town she grew up in, in, in Perigord. We went down there, we did research, we talked to the mayor of the village where these events happened. And um, he told us the whole, the whole story actually. And, uh, and then we went and we talked to a few people who were just in the street kind of, you know, hanging around. And one of them also knew the story because her father knew the people involved. And then one old man came out of his uh, house and he goes in his yard and he starts he kind of talked to us and he said, do you know so-and-so? And we didn't, we just said, no. And he turned around and he went back in his house and we never saw him again for the whole weekend. And we figured that he, might, he may have been involved in the story and not in a good way. So anyway, so there we were down in the Perigord interview of, you know, researching this story. And then um, we went to the archives in Perigord where I found the a newspaper article that was very instrumental in this. And Philippe went to the Fort de Vincennes where they have all the, um, the uh, reports of the gendarmes in all the different parts of France. And we got the records of what happened down there on that specific day. So we were really getting a lot of research done, but I decided to fictionalize this for many different reasons. Um, and that's, that's why really I started um, learning how to write fiction, because I didn't know how to write fiction. So I got a book. Do you know the writer Elizabeth George? She's American, but everybody thinks she's English. You know, she's, she's lived in, I guess she lived in England for a long time and, and she just sounds English. And anyway, she wrote this book about writing fiction and how she does it. And I was totally hooked on everything she said. I took copious notes and, um, and I, try to apply what she said to what I was writing. So she was a big help. And then I went to a couple of writing seminars at, um, with Samantha Chang from the um, Iowa Writing Workshop. She's the director of it. She had one at Weiss and she had one at the American Library in Paris. So I did that and, and uh, you know went around to do all this. Anyway, that was the inspiration for my fictional story. Well, it, I think all of you here know what that story is. It's a young girl uh, in, in the provinces, who um, is comes from a very humble family, and they move to a bigger town and where there's a castle, and the lady of the castle takes her under her wing and mentors her, and um, elevates her to a position or a world that she doesn't, she wouldn't naturally never have been in, and then the family moves to Paris, where she marries a wealthy man thanks to this countess who has educated her to be in these kinds of milieu she never would have been in normally. And he betrays her and then she goes back to her town, but her town has changed because and meanwhile, the Nazis have um, invaded all of France, not just the one part of it. So, and then she makes a big mistake. And the big mistake she makes is due to her own personality and her own kind of um, obsessions. You might say that she walked into her own trap. But anyway, so that, that is the story. Okay, and uh, now the story is not only about World War II. What I'm gonna show on what, uh, Adrian's gonna help me with the slides. I'm gonna show the slides that pertain to the part about World War II and then uh, we'll kind of backtrack and to the beginning of the book, okay? So you want me to? Yeah, could you just put first? Slide? Yeah, let me, um, let's see. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. There we go. Everybody okay, see that's, it? That's me and that's the uh, cover of the book, okay? Um, I will have some remarks to make later on too about the process of this book, uh, publishing it, getting it in between two covers, but I won't go into that right now. So we can go to the next um, slide. Uh, those are my books. This French Toast was the first one and then French Pride and then Joie de Vivre and then Final Transgression. 
and which was the most fun to write. Uh, this, the French toast was the most cathartic. French fried was really fun because I got to interview all these people in, uh, you know, the wine and food uh, uh, business. And uh, it was just fabulous. I mean, I will never forget the champagne tasting I had personally at the Ritz with the sommelier <laughs> from Alain Ducasse restaurant. I mean, it was just unbelievable. That was fabulous. And then Joie de Vivre is a slightly more mellow me, uh, you know, kind of recapping uh, all the things I said in the other two books. And uh, that was a, a joy to write too. It was really fun. Um, I could have kept on writing those books, but uh, this story presented itself to me and I wanted to write it in fiction. So I just, I went off, as you said, as Adrian said, <laughs> digressing. <laughs> going on to something new. Okay, so we can do this. All right. Not transgressing, but digressing. Digressing. <laughs> Not transgressing. Exactly. Not transgressing. Great. So now we're going to go to my slides on World War II. I'm not going to give you a history lesson because there are probably people out there who know uh, more than I do about World War II history, but I certainly did learn a lot in my extensive research for this book. This first slide show, uh, shows a man watching the German troops um, as they parade down the Champs-Élysées. Well, actually it's two different pictures. You can't, one, one is of the German troops. The other one is the man watching the German troops. And on his, his face is so expressive and it's such an expression of, he's being, he's aghast, he's appalled, he's stunned. He cannot believe that in the blink of an eye, the Germans uh, invaded his country and they've taken it over. Um, and so uh, the, the French were not prepared for this uh, defeat. The French generals kind of screwed up, excuse my vocabulary, by uh, preparing for it, but in the wrong way, they prepared for it with the Maginot Line over on the east of the country and the Germans came in unexpectedly from the north and just plowed in and that was it, it was over. So uh, in my book, uh, Severine is stunned, Carolyn is furious, Antoine thinks that the Germans deserve their victory. Okay, so there are different reactions to this. Under but, you, yeah. I mean, okay. your name was there. So uh, I think we can go on to the next slide there. Uh, okay. Um, what did it bring about? Among other things, it brought about uh, deprivation and people uh, spent their time queuing for food with their ration tickets and uh, they had little to eat. Why? Because uh, the Germans took the best of everything for themselves, the coal, the leather, material, food, and uh, the, the rations were very strict. That's to say the normal caloric uh, calories per day that an adult uh, would eat, and the recommended amount would be like 2000 calories. And during the war, the French had the, the right to have 1200. So it's all, it's, you know, almost half of that. That's not a lot. Um, so my mother-in-law often told me stories about those days. And one day we were in her kitchen in the country and I'm peeling potatoes, okay? And she's looking at these piles of potato peelings that are growing, you know, on, on the counter next to us. And she said, well, I can see that you've never been in the war. Now you might interpret that as a mother-in-law remark. And I probably did at the time, but then I started thinking about it. And then I realized why she saved everything that they had and why she was so careful. It's because during the war, they, they just had so little and they just really never got over that. And um, she would save string and you know everything, like kind of like the um, Carolyn in the book. So um, she also could never bring herself to eat rabbit, not because she didn't like rabbit, because she ate everything, but because during the war, uh, sometimes they would pass off a rabbit, uh, pass off a cat as a rabbit, and so that finished it for her for life. Anyway, that's just to tell you uh, that the French were obsessed with food and getting food and for good reason. Um, now, the next slide, um, as the fictional character discovers and as the real people in the real war discovered, uh, France had become a German country. 
and there was a lot of propaganda, a lot of propaganda signs with uh, road signs in German, uh, clocks on German time, signs like this saying, you know, just trust the German soldier and everything will be fine. You know, go off and work in Germany and you'll be happy. So they really were, uh, as they walked down the streets of Paris, these were the kinds of signs and, uh, uh, that they saw. And it was very clear. They were no longer in France. They were a German country and the Germans owned them. Okay, so we'll have to have the next slide. Um, so Marshal Pétain, who was the World War I hero, uh, established a collaborationist government. The idea behind it apparently was that he thought that the, he might cut a better deal if he collaborated with the Germans than doing whatever he could do. Uh, but of course that wasn't true. Uh, it was a puppet government. And one of the first things that Pétain did on the 3rd of October, 1940, was to bring in uh, the statutes on Jews. And those statutes led to the exclusion of Jews in the army and the press and business and uh, many other things and generally excluding them from society. And it was a terrible thing to do. But this was just the beginning of the um, collaborationist government. Uh, another, uh, uh, I was just going to make a remark there. My my uh, father-in-law was not Jewish, but he was a business owner, and he had to go back three generations to prove that he his none of his grandparents or great grandparents were Jewish. Uh, so all of this you know, was a big change in society and directed, of course, against the Jewish popula population. Uh, now, this other um, picture over here is of a true exhibition that took place in 1941, and it was called Le Juif et la France, the Jew and France. And uh, this was, the purpose of this was to uh, tell people who their enemy was. And it was a terrible, thing. I've seen posters of what was inside of it. Uh, it was every single caricature that you could possibly imagine about the grasping Jew and, you know, just imagine the worst and it was in it. And two of my characters are um, in, in this uh, exhibition. And um, if I just have a little bit of time, I can read you a passage in the book about it for those who haven't read it. Uh, Carolyn and her sister are having a little um, discussion about uh, Carolyn has decided to sew the yellow star on her vest and Severine comes in and asks her what she's doing. And Severine says that she has a Jewish um, friend and she feels sympathy for her. So she wants to, um, you know, be uh, in solidarity with her. And, um, and so they're batting that back and forth. And uh, Cara, uh, Severine says, well, listen, you can get arrested. So I don't think that's a very good idea. And now I will read from the book. Um, she, uh, Severine says, are you crazy? Don't you know that this is no time for pranks? If you are detained, even when they see you're not Jewish, they won't appreciate your sympathy for, for those who are, believe me. It's not only sympathy, Carolyn protested, the Germans are wrong to arrest the Jews, to force them to wear this ridiculous star. And the French police, at least the ones I've seen, are as despicable as the Germans. She scrutinized her sister, but Severine's face was unreadable. Well, don't you hate the whole thing too, she demanded. She'd never figured out Severine's politics, although she knew Antoine's all too well. Like their parents, he was for Pétain. Unlike their parents, however, who were passive supporters, he was active, very active. She shivered slightly as she thought about the cold January day. She'd happened by the Boulevard des Italiens where a huge poster advertising an exhibition at the Palais Berlitz called The Jew in France had caught her eye. She figured it would be ignominious and it was. Inside the hall, she had stood in front of, the rend of a rendition of the head of a, in quotes, typical Jew with, she read on the descriptive label, his charnel open mouth, thick lips, large, massive, and protruding ears. Filled with anger, revulsion, and shame, she had elbowed her way through the congested crowd, stopping only once to take in a delegation of important looking people listening raptly to their well-dressed and knowledgeable guide. 
Antoine. She had never told Severine about that day. So here we go. I put my characters inside this exhibition um, to, to show their different points of views. Uh, two different people doing two different things. Okay, so we can go on to the next one now. Uh, oh, now I was talking about posters. As they walk down the streets, they would see German propaganda, but of course they would see propaganda uh, from Vichy. And um, Severine very cleverly decides she's gonna use these posters for her own needs. What are her needs? Well, her need is to have a baby with Antoine. She is absolutely obsessed with the idea of having a baby and starting a family. And that's what she wants more than anything else. So she saw a sign that suited her purpose. It featured two houses. Here it is over here. One in fine shape, the other crumbling. The roof of the proper up tight, up upright yellow house was held up by four pillars, each featuring an important aspect of the new France under Vichy, education, the crafts industry, the peasantry and the legion, which referred to the legion of French volunteers against Bolshevism. In case people still didn't understand, the words discipline, order, work, family, and father, land were written on the structure. The other house representing the old France, which you can see on the left side, uh, was built on foundations of laziness, demagoguery, and internationalism. It was dilapidated and sat askew, brought down by the evils of the popular front, which had governed between 1936 and 1938. Those evils were the Freemasons, Jews, greed, the parliament, and even pastis, a popular licorice flavored anise aperitif, a large star of David loomed above the old house. So that's one uh, thing that she uh, uses by saying, you know, we need to have a family because the new motto is work, family, and fatherland. And then she finds another one, this other poster over here with a couple on a raft. It says, un couple à la dérive. So today she decided to try again with fresh ammunition. You know, Antoine, I saw this poster on a wall the other day as I was walking home. In fact, two posters in two different places. The first one said, if you want to rebuild France, first give her children. The second one said, a household without a child, a couple adrift. She didn't tell him how powerfully the second poster had struck her as she stood transfixed, contemplating the young couple perched on a raft in a rough sea with high winds that had shredded the mast. She had drawn closer and stared at it so intensely that the couple had seemed to transform into herself and Antoine before her eyes. She felt as if Marshal Pétain was speaking directly to her. What kind of patriot was she in wartime if she didn't have a family? And patriotism aside, what kind of life would she have without children in it? Why didn't Antoine understand this? Why was she the only one of the two who wanted a child? She tried to ca sound casual as she continued. I've been thinking about the Vichy motto, work, family, fatherland, that replaced liberty, equality, fraternity. You're pretty good at work and fatherland, she remarked. <laughs> his jewelry business and his political activities ate up most of his time. Uh, she wanted to blurt out how unhappy she was, tell him everything, beg him to start a family this very minute, but felt she mustn't go too far. Torn between speaking her mind and the fear of being a nag, she fell silent. So, said Antoine, I'm liking when it comes to the family part and to please Marshal Pétain, you want to make babies, is that right? Two's company, three's a crowd, no matter what Marshal Pétain says. And you know that I think he's right on most things, don't you? So they get a discussion going on this, but she's used the posters for herself. At least she's been able to recuperate something from that. So, um, We'll go on after these posters and to the next to the last slide. The next slide is, uh, what do you do when your country is invaded? Do you resist? Do you collaborate? Do something in between? Well, 
in my book, uh, Paul uh, is a resistor. He's in the secret army, which is the Gaullist resistance group. Luke is a resistor. He's a communist, the communist resistance. Carolyn tries to resist by sewing on the star and be she has already befriended a, a Jewish uh, woman and worked with her. And uh, Antoine is a collaborator. Um, Severine and Carolyn's parents are like many people, they're in a wait and see position. And that's what I wanted to say is that most people were in between these two. On one side, we have the Maquis and on the other, the Melis. The Maquis, of course, are the resistance. Uh, they're called the Maquis because um, they would go into the Maquis, which is a thick underbrush woods outside of towns where the Germans could not find them. Um, and they would there train to sabotage um, uh, the Nazis and uh, uh, train arms and explosives, how to work them. Uh, and the milice, the milice on the other side was the um, uh, uh, Vichy funded, founded and funded group uh, by Marshal Patin. And these were the French people who chose to collaborate. And interestingly enough, there are numbers on this, but basically it was the same amount of numbers on both sides with the great majority of people being in the middle in a wait and see position. So um, we'll go on to the next slide, which will be the last slide. Well, at the end of the war, it, it was a time of score settling. This is the period that interested me the most uh, in this uh, particular, uh, my book and in the history of uh, the war in, in Southwest France and in other parts of France. Um, now this picture is taken by the famous photographer, Robert Kappa. Uh, as you see, there's a woman with her head shaved and she's carrying a baby and she's being paraded through the streets of Chartres with all these people jeering at her and staring at her and uh, humiliating her. It's, it's just the most ignominious um, photo and experience that anybody could experience. Obviously she had slept with a German and um, had a baby with this German. But you wonder about the other people in the picture. Were they trying to expiate their own bad behavior? What was going on here? Um, so this was a, a time in which uh, scores were settled, both uh, political and personal. Um, and there was something worse than having your head shaved and that was getting shot. And it was getting shot uh, without a trial because there were trials that were held at the end of the war. Uh, de Gaulle made sure that there were, and there were 1,500 collaborators who were executed after these trials and they were found guilty. But there were also an astonishing number of people who were killed without trial and they were suspected collaborators. Nothing proved that they had been. And there were 10,000 of those people. So. Uh, this is a fascinating um, period of French history. I have a book I can hold up later that I used a lot uh, in my research on this period uh, called the Operation uh, Sauvage. Um, so I just finished these slides with a quote, uh, which I think uh, is very apt. And it's um, by Francois Mauriac, the great French writer. And he said, revenge disguised as justice is our most horrendous grimace. So that is the end of these slides. And we can go back and talk a little bit about the, the, the beginning of the story, if you would like to. OK, thank you. Merci. Thank, thank you, Harriet. Should I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unshare this now so we can go back to a speaker view. OK. OK, okay. I can see people now. All right. Right. We can okay. go back on. Well, and uh, so did you want to, uh, you are open to questions? Well, I have just a, a very few more remarks about the beginning of the book, because uh, obviously what interests me in this book is describing what happened at the end and the drama comes at the end. You know, some books, you start with the drama, you know what happened, but this book builds up to it. And um, what happens in the beginning, I structured the book uh, in paradise, the Parish Years and Paradise Lost. 
And what was paradise? Paradise was what the little Severine at age eight discovers when they moved from her little hamlet, which is just filled with ducks and geese and things, to a big town. And the big town's probably about, you know, 2,000 people. But for her, it was uh, paradise and with everything that she thought was just so wonderful, shops and school and everything. And then I, we bring uh, her up to the point where she goes to Paris. Uh, the Countess has mentored her and she's uh, able to take on life in Paris. And she meets the son of a wealthy apartment owners in the building in which her parents are concierge. But this doesn't phase her because she has a lot of self-worth and she has aspirations and so she knows that her parents may be concierge, but she's not going to end up that way. And she doesn't. She ends up married to this uh, very wealthy man. Um, and he betrays her. And then in this last part of the book, it's called Paradise Lost, because she does go back to her hometown. But uh, everything changes because of the war and because of the... Um, because of something I can't tell you about if, if you haven't read the book. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and so then we do end the book with the drama that happens to her that is unfortunately of her own making. So I, I will end there. And um, yes, we can open it up to questions. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Harriet, so much. Yes. Yeah, so you. when did this start? The book? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I just tuned in. I'm uh, in the States. I'm in New York. And I, oh. I, I thought it was one o'clock our time. It started an hour ago. Oh, no. <sighs> no, it's, it's okay. You're here now, Debbie. Okay. <laughs> You're here now. Okay. Do you remember me? Do you remember me? Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. I'm still so, thinking okay. about it. Still thinking okay, about it. I'm, I'm gonna put you on mute, however, so other people can ask questions. Okay. Um, let's see, you can put your questions into chat. Um, we have one from Ruth Ann Lake. Do you wanna unmute Ruth and ask your question? Okay, I was just wondering, because I am based in uh, France and Nice, if the book goes between Paris and the Southwest of France, or it goes to different places in the whole country. Oh, okay, good question. Just Paris and the Southwest of France because I am focusing on a very specific place in Perigord. Okay. Okay, yeah, in Perigord. Yeah. I know Judy Ruck has a question. I have two questions. First of all, Harriet, uh, as you are aware, I've read the book twice and I was in contact with you about yes, uh, yes. a particular place that I'm hoping someday to stay in Paris. Anyway, with that being said, uh, I thought it was exceptionally written as you depicted uh, the different social classes. Um, but I, yeah, but I do have a question from the beginning of your writing, mm -hmm. or perhaps when did you decide that you were going to show the character Antoine as a cad and a scoundrel? You know, it, yeah. Uh, it came naturally. Okay. Uh, it just kind of happened. I was thinking about him. I was thinking about who Severine married and that he's the wealthy son of these, you know, people who have a great apartment near the Parc Monceau and all this. Uh, and he was a World War I uh, ace pilot. Exactly. I mean, he shot down German planes. So it's, you would say, oh my, well, that's astounding. How could he become a collaborator but he was so put off and disgusted by the German victory because the French generals had not planned uh, to you know uh, counter them that he just did a big turn and uh, and he, he went on the side of uh, Pétain. Okay I have one additional question if I may ask it how long uh, did it take you to actually write the book? And then if you, uh, with your permission, did you use any kind of word processing program or did you just write? Oh, okay. 
Uh, it took me forever. I'm almost embarrassed to say how long it took. It, but you have to distinguish writing the book from getting the idea and exactly. the book to its end. So I got the idea. Uh, let's put it this way. One of my granddaughters was there when I got the idea and she was seven years old and she's now 20. <laughs> so that's to tell you how long the process was. I got the idea. In between times, I wrote Joie de Vivre. I mean, it wasn't like I was sitting around doing nothing. And, um, but it took all that time to process this in my head and to do the research and to, you know, it took a long time. And I just wrote it on my computer, but I also wrote it with notes. You know, every time I, I discovered something, I would write handwritten notes and, or I'd take a walk and I'd get an idea and then I would rush home and put it on the computer, you know? Yeah, so it was, I, I think if I wrote another fiction book, I would be a bit more efficient about it. I mean, I hope. <laughs> um, just as an aside, Harry, you know, there's a uh, text program called Scrivener. I've heard of it. Yeah. Really excellent, right, for, for authors. So for I, people who want to know, who want a program that they can work in really well and move chapters around and things like that, Scrivener. Right. Oh, well, listen, I, I know about that, but I didn't use it and I should have, but that was one of my many, you know, not mistakes, but things I didn't do. <laughs> Merci beaucoup, uh, Harriet. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank Judy, you. Nice to see I you. I want to thank Judy because Judy is literally on every event that we host and we appreciate your participation, Judy. Just wanted you to know that. Thank you. You're always here. In fact, if you don't show up, I'm going to have to call home and make sure you're okay. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we have a question. I'd like, that... I'd like to say something. Hello. Oh, oh Talia. You, Miss Talia Carter. Hello, everybody. Uh, well, thank you, Henry, it's very much. I found it very interesting. I like the subject. I believe that I noticed your note on the Authors Guild question website okay. a few months ago oh, really? when you mentioned about the purging of uh, after the war of 10,000. Yeah. And it interested me so much that I ended up watching a French television series, A French Village. Oh, yes. Which I wonderful. recommend as probably yeah. a supplement to your book because it gave uh, additional insights. Uh, and just, I would like more to give you a piece of advice if possible. Have you contacted the Jewish Book Council? No, I haven't. All right, so uh, Adrian will give you my email and I will put you in touch with them. Okay, well, thank you. For those of you who do not know, Talia Karner is a formidable author of many fantastic books, and she has spoken for us before, so we're happy to have her here. Well, that is just delightful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate thank that. Thank you, and good luck to you. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, and Talia. by the way, the process of taking 13 years is yeah. not unusual between the idea <laughs> to, to <laughs> most of our, most of authors authors including myself so yes. don't uh, uh, feel that it's just too long it takes me five years to write the actual book okay so, you yeah, just made okay. me feel a lot better because yeah, this is you're okay <laughs> you're on timeline <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you Tom now I have an interesting question from Anne Marie Fontaine would you like to unmute and, and ask it yourself Anne Marie, is she there? Well, I don't know if she heard, uh, but okay. Her question is, oh. since your book is somewhat based on the life, are you there, Anne Marie? Okay, I'm gonna say it. Since your book is somewhat based on the life of your husband's aunt, how did your research affect your husband's perception of his aunt and her life? Ah, good question. Well, uh-huh. Uh, -huh. uh he had always heard about this aunt as someone uh, very special to my, my uh, to his mother. Uh, his mother really looked up to this aunt as uh, someone who had, uh, who was vastly superior to the rest of them. You must remember that this is a humble family. The, the grandmother was a concierge. She was a concierge in Paris. 
and uh, this this her daughter uh, read literature and she played the piano beautifully and she you know kind of like Severine. And so uh, Philippe always had a, a, a fantastic impression of his aunt. Um, he was troubled by, uh, of, of course, I made up that stuff about the Germans. I mean, that, that wasn't the real story, but I, I, she, she, uh, her, she met her fate. Um, she met her fate out of some score settling that had to do more with um, personal vengeance uh, mixed a bit with political. So uh, he was troubled, very troubled, so was I. But we don't think the less of the aunt because she, in our opinion, and from what we looked at, she wasn't giving information to the enemy or being a collaborator. It was a terrible mistake, but it was a mistake that made it an indelible stain on his, on his family, definitely. So. Okay. Uh, and Sarah Vaughn, you want to unmute and uh, ask your question? Um, hi. Yes. Thanks. Hi. Thanks very much for the. It, 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 I can't wait to go out and get the book. So. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> wonderful. And I wanted to ask you about this great deal of discussion still going on in France about the gray areas that con that uh, constitute what. Uh, collaboration really was. Was it survival in some respects that women needed just to survive on their own while their men were fighting? Was it by not fighting back? Are you considered a collaborator or only active collaborators? And that, that gray ambiguity, is that almost a character in itself in your novel? Yes, uh, definitely, definitely. Because there is that question. Let's say that you are a guy who is uh, a waiter in a restaurant you serve the Germans your coffee. Is are you a collaborator? Huh? So you know, there is a gray area. <laughs> okay. Now uh, you could also be somebody who sleeps with the German and gives him all kinds of uh, information, and that's a collaborator. You know. So it's you know who's a collaborator? I'll tell you a story. One of my uh, my mother in laws and father in laws friends was a prefect. You know, like kind of like a regional governor. He was a prefect under Vichy, okay? Like many people. I mean, they're a prefect and then the Vichy comes in and they, they don't resign. Most of them didn't resign. They just kept on doing their job, but their new bosses and just happened to be uh, the Germans. Uh, you know, we, we see this situation in the Village Francais. Huh? Um, and so uh, the resistance took him out in the woods to shoot him because he'd been a, pre a prefect under Vichy and um, something happened and they changed their minds and his life was spared. Wow. So this is one of the many stories about, you know, these times. Um, I have one, you know, one further question, if I might, it's very short, but I, I just wondered what that appalling looking animal is behind your head on the bookshelf. Oh, it's a very, <laughs> <laughs> that's horrible. I didn't mean to it's a, it looks like a beetle, but it's this kind of huge um, insect from Peru. <laughs> I wouldn't want to have it flying in my bedroom at night, I'll tell you that. <laughs> okay. I didn't notice it was very heavy. I can put it away someplace else if you don't No, no, it's okay. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Thank, yeah, so thank you, Sarah. Okay, yeah. Uh, Sumner Hargrove, you want to unmic and ask your question? Hi, hi, Adrian. Hi, Harriet. Hi, hi Sumner. How's everybody? Great. Uh, you've you've touched on something that's so classic, but this idea for all of this that have lived in France for a very long time. I'm now at thirty years. You meet all these people of the generation above us and they say, oh, my uncle, my aunt, they were in the resistance and everyone was in the resistance. And after you've been here a while, you're kind of like, oh, wait a minute, all these people could not have been in the resistance. Then you go back to America and people are always bragging, we were on the Mayflower. We were here. <laughs> if everyone was on the Mayflower that said they were on the Mayflower, we always say it would have sunk. So, 
is this may, maybe it's not a French thing. Maybe it's a human temptation to, it's not great. I think it's horrible that people say they were resistant. They weren't resistant. I'm just wondering, maybe this is a human temptation to want to get on the side of the history you wish your ancestors could have been on. Well, I don't think anybody's very proud of, of being, if, if they were a collaborator, they weren't proud of it um, no. <laughs> at all. Uh, well, one thing about the resistance is that, um, you know, De Gaulle was, I mean, De Gaulle was criticized for giving uh, every French person the idea that he was a resistant. But De Gaulle had to do that because this country was, had been, I mean, they bombed the smithereens out of most of the towns and it was a poor country reduced to rubble and de Gaulle had to give them something to, you know, he couldn't afford to have a country in which uh, the natural tendency towards squabbling of the French would continue. He had to get them united somehow. So in 1942, he sent Jean Moulin in to unify the resistance movement, which was, which had uh, been up to then, then uh, various movements of resistance. I mean, you know, communist and this and that, everybody had his own resistance movement. So de Gaulle got all that together, he unified it. And then uh, when the war was over, uh, uh, you know, if everybody said they were gonna be resistant, so, so be it kind of thing, you know? I mean, it was a, an alternative. What are you gonna do, go out in the streets and say, oh, by the way, I was a collaborator. <laughs> You know, so no, you're going to say you're resistant, you know, and, and people know when, when people were or they weren't. It's pretty, pretty clear. People know a lot of things. In fact, I was going to make a point about when we went into that little village uh, to interview the mayor. Remember, I told you back, we went down to Perigar and we interviewed the mayor and everything. And he, at the end of his conversation in which he had told me these stories about the, the, the resistance and the millies and everything like this, he said, listen, uh, let's just keep this among ourselves. Okay, everything he told us. And I'm saying to myself, wait a minute, we're in the year 2009 or something, or no, later, you know. And I said, wait a minute, keep it to ourselves after all this time? But I see what he meant. It is still so alive for, for people and everybody knows what everybody else did during the war. They all know, and that's why in these small villages, a lot of people are closed mouthed because if they opened their mouths, the things they would say would be just devastating in some cases. So better to keep the mouth closed. That might also account for the reason that the French are not like the Americans. We've never been occupied. We don't have these stories. When the French, you know, they're not walking down the street, you know, hi, friendly and stuff, smiling because all of this stuff has happened on their soil for hundreds of years in many wars and they don't trust each other any farther than they can throw each other. So that's just my editorial comment on it. <laughs> Harriet, one of, one of you culture gurus said étranger equals danger. I remember huh? reading that and I can't remember I think that's which Holly book, Platt. which book was, was Polly Platt. Polly Platt, yeah. Étranger yeah. yeah. equals yeah. danger. Wait, just a tidbit. I took the notes for French or faux. I was hers. I was Polly's assistant. My first. Oh, time. you were. Oh, that's funny. Oh, oh, that's funny. Yeah, interesting. Like the character. Well, I don't know if I answered your question or not. I kind of went off on a tangent. No, you did. You did. Yeah. Of course. So. Thank you. Yeah, it's all very complicated. Huh? I never realized how complicated it was until I started doing this research, and then my eyes were opened wide. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you, you, you don't get, Harry, you don't get this point of view very often. I mean, it seems like you can, you get the point of view from the resistance fighters or from the Jews or from, but you don't get the point of view from the average person living in France at the time, having to deal with that life. Right. And, and just trying to survive in yeah. effect. 
And that is what I wanted to do in this book because I read many books. You know, I read Sarah's Key and Lila Girls and Mind, all those books, but I never saw a book in which people, uh, well, first of all, in my book, they're all French and they live in France. You know, there's no, uh, 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 there's no English resistant being flown in, you know, there's, right. they, they live in France, this is their life and it's complicated. And I, I just thought that would be an interesting aspect of a, a subject that uh, so many people have written so right. many books about. Mm -hmm. uh, Margaret Cook, you have a question if you wanna unmute and ask your question. Yes, I uh, enjoyed your speech so much. Uh, Thank you. I, your talk, <laughs> yeah. Um, toward the end of your speech, you uh, talked, you, you gave a quote that I really like and would like you to finish because I didn't get it all down. Yeah. Revenge disguised as justice. And, yes. the, and the gentleman who, es who espoused this? Yeah, uh, the quote is revenge disguised as justice is our most horrendous grimace. Grimace? Yes, grimace. And the writer is Francois Mauriac. Merci. Hey. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I see lots of people who are already saying they're they like while you're talking, Harriet, they're ordering your book. Oh, well, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> that's very, very nice to hear. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Um, I'm just looking through the ones that have come through in chat. I, I do. Okay, ask it. Um, where did you do your research? I did it uh, basically in the Perigord, where the action took place for a lot of the book. At the light, was there a library or was it mostly interviews? It, it was interviews. And then I went to the archives uh, of Perigueux, which is the uh, town, which is the important town where everything goes on. And I did uh, research. Uh, I, I have scores of books on this period specialized. I'm going to show you two of them right now. Uh, this is one that I picked up. Did I speak to you or did we talk about research at all? I mean, basically, a little bit. That, that, that I told you that I like to do my own research. Did I tell you that? I don't have a research well, assistant. Yeah. Well, tell us so, again. Okay, I'll tell you again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm confusing things because I had a, a talk right before this one, so I don't want to repeat myself. Anyway, um, I like to do my own research. I don't want to hire somebody to do it for me. Why? I mean, um, I think that I know what I want and I, I have this kind of like flair for what I'm going to find. And I don't think somebody I would hire would have that. So when I was in the Perigord, I went to the local papeterie, the local bookstore kind of thing where they sell papers and stuff. And on the shelves, I saw this book. I don't know if you can see it. It's called the Journal sous l'occupation en Perigord. Wow. And this was an incredible mm -hmm. find for many reasons. This was written by, at the time, 1942, 1945. These are the letters that the mother in law of Andre Morois, who's a famous French writer who's Jewish and who spent the war in New York, that she wrote York into him and also to several friends. And it is an account of the war as it's happening. It's absolutely extraordinary. And she- Did you say Andre Malraux? It was Andre yeah. Malraux? Morois, Morois, he was oh, a biographer. Morois. Morois. Yeah. And the other interesting thing about it is because I'm in a Proust book club and I'm obsessed by Proust these days. It, she was the model, she, uh, Jeanne Pouquet, was the model for Gilles. So I thought that was a real small world story. It's incredible. Anyway, she was my model for the Countess in, uh, 
in my book, Jean Pouquet. But anyway, wow. I found this book and it just opened up a whole new world to me because uh, I, it was as if I were sitting back there in 1942 and living the war as it was happening. So it wasn't one of these things where somebody wrote it 50 years afterwards. Uh, and then this book, this is a huge book called L'Epuration Sauvage. It's all about the wild purges that took place at the end of the war. I mean, as you can see, it's a huge book. He's a, uh, he's a historian. I think he's a historian, Burdell, yeah. And um, I mean, stories and stories and stories and stories about the events that took place during this time. It's absolutely unbelievable. And I have a whole library of things like that. I mean, I spent my, my days poring over these things. So fascinating, really. So, and, uh, and then I, you know, kind of brought it all down and put it together, so. Anyone else have any questions? I see Ella's raising her hand. Unmute Ella. Go ahead and ask your question. Ella, you have to unmute. I did, I thought, but now I can. Thank you, Harriet. So fascinating. My late mother-in-law landed in Normandy a few days after the Allies and oh. army, uh, an army nurse uh -huh. and, uh, visited us here in Nice many, many times. And uh, so your story resonates with me from her experiences. She's unfortunately no longer with us. However, I did have the absolute pleasure of meeting a wonderful Niçoise woman uh, years ago. And when she was 14 or 15, she would run um, messages from Nice to Marseille and uh -huh. back. Uh -huh. And she is still so vibrant and doesn't live far from me. I always think, how do we tell her story? How can we tell? I have videos and photos of her. Um, really? How can I possibly get her story as she's now, I think, going to be 94, 95 years old. And but nobody's ever interviewed her? Nobody's ever? Uh, that you know, I don't know. She's very humble. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. She was also a, a copy artist um, in Paris. She's an amazing artist. Oh. And I just would like very much for somebody to um, at, at least document this physical book that she has. Yeah. Uh, well, um, my advice is if you want to do it yourself, just go for it. <laughs> yes, Ella is an author. <clears throat> Ella yeah. is an author of uh, Nice and Nice. And oh, yeah, why don't you write this stuff, Ella? Uh, because fortunately, Adrian keeps me so busy here. And <laughs> he's moved to France. <laughs> I don't necessarily have the time nor the talent. Mm -hmm. Ella's Ella's our top search consultant in Nice. Okay, as it turns okay, out, good. Yes. Well, well, listen, just hold on, hold on to the idea, but don't hold on to it too long. I'll tell you something. Uh, I wanted to. Uh, I. The reason I wanted to come to France is because in our small town in Iowa, we had many refugees from Europe after the war, and one of them was a French woman and her family with whom my family became great friends. And she started telling me about her life one day and um, I was so stupid. I didn't sit down and take notes and get on it. And then time went by and, and then she was, she got old and she died and it's over, there's no way. And she had the most fascinating things to tell about oh. her life always says that every time an old person and now he's speaking about us every so does a library yeah exactly so uh i think it's important you know i know i know it's important to capture this however you can um, adrian will go with me to see mayor Estrosi, and we'll commission him to contact her because she is 
part of the uh, ceremony that takes place on my street on Jean Medecin where uh, two uh, resistance fighters were hung uh, mm -hmm. July 7th, mm -hmm. six before Nice was liberated. And yeah. she was returning from Marseille with some documents and seeing their bodies still. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, this is definitely a story to pursue. She's amazing. I just don't know how to, I don't know how to um, outsource it to the proper person. Yeah, well... I, I <laughs> you know enough you know enough writers in Nice, Ella. You could probably uh, collaborate yeah. with someone. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't use that word. Uh, <laughs> collaborate. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, the problem, yeah. But the thing about a story is, you know, if you really gotta be very motivated to write a story, you know. It's because I have many ideas. Oh my goodness! If I had a book for every idea I had, I'd I'd have written thousands of books, but uh, from going from the idea and the research to the story is another. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's something to take into account and think about. But uh, I will. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. May I ask one more? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> it's a good. I think it's a good segue, Harriet. Um, I hope other people want to know too. It's the writerly question, the fantasy, the mystery. Do you have a time of day you write? Do you have a routine? Do you have a period of time you write? You know, you say, I'm going to sit down and do, you know, all the different writing teachers do, do a certain amount of day. How does that work? Well, it doesn't work that way for me. Um, I'm a real mess for that. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, it's not like the spirit moves me kind of thing, but, um, let's put it this way. If I get in the mood and I've done a lot of work and research and I want to put it all together, I'm capable of just losing track of time and just going for it. You know, as long as it lasts, it just goes. But I'm not one of these regular people who gets up in the morning and sits there and, you know, forces myself to write a thousand words kind of thing. I mean, unfortunately, I think, it, I think it's a good thing to be that way, but I just can't be that way, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's see, anybody else? I thought I saw a question on the chat, but maybe not, no? Oh, we have we have a few, um, just some comments like from Jill Reynolds that her mother was also from an Iowa town. Jill, you wanna talk about it? Does she unmute? That was a few minutes ago. Okay, no, no problem. I'm just trying to think if there's anything I left out while I uh, talk about this um, that might be interesting to you. But I think I said quite a bit um, without giving away. Oh, somebody said, what is the hardest part of writing the book? This isn't a different thing. And I said, uh, the, the sex scene, there was only one, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Oh, there was only one scene, and man, I just, I just found that I don't know how people write these. What was that Shades of Grey thing? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would never write Shades of Grey because I could hardly get through the scene that I was writing on. But um, uh, the other thing that was difficult, but the hardest thing was um, going from the French that was I was hearing in my head uh, for the dialogue, and putting it in English. Because the Try translating translating the French into the, into English dialogue. Yeah, and and then my English dialogue would sound stiff or weird or something, you know, because it was coming in in on one channel in French and then it was going into English and it was uh, that was hard to do. Because I had all my. It's true. You did, you, so you didn't actually write any of the dialogue in French and then translate it no, in the book. No, no, I heard no, it in French. Right. I heard them talking to each other in French and then I put it in English. Yeah, that was hard. Yeah. Um, so, and Lynn Frank just put in a question. Lynn, you want to uh, unmute and ask it? See if she comes forward. She wants to know if you know of any Jews who were hidden in or near the, that town in Perigord. Ah, well, there were what they called foreign Jews, that's to say people who came from uh, Poland and different countries who were in hiding. And yes, they, they were, uh-huh. 
they were in hiding. And um, yeah, well, there so was those two. are the stories you usually hear. You usually hear the yeah. stories about the, the French who hid yeah. Jews, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. the nuns who hid Jews right. and all of that. But but you, I've never certainly read a story like yours about yeah. a French woman who's just trying to you know, deal with her own life and ignore basically in lots of ways, everything that was going on around her just to survive. Yeah, well, she had tunnel vision, but she wasn't alone. Uh, let's, let's put it this way. Um, she, she grew up in a town where there weren't any Jews uh, and she didn't know any. Oh, yeah, and she didn't know any. And so it wasn't foremost in her mind to save Jews because she didn't know any and there weren't, a, uh, in her town, uh, there weren't any until uh, really the end, mm, the end of the war when people were hiding, things like that. So it was a different point of view. Uh -huh. Well, you know, I'm going to tell you something. In my story, I almost, but there is a Jewish character who's a friend of, um, of Carolyn. Her name is Fanny. I was going to invent a little sister for Fanny. And I was gonna have her being hidden someplace in the castle, okay? And then I said, no, I'm not gonna do that because you can't tell too many stories in a story. And then you're getting away from your, the originality of your story, which is just- now that's called the digressing. Yes, <laughs> super digressing, you know. <laughs> oh my God. So I said, no, listen, ladies, stick to your story, okay? And just- <laughs> Stick to, yeah, stick to your story. Yeah. Yeah, we all know that problem, like going off on tangents and, and yeah. going down the wrong yeah. path, right? Yeah, sure. And also when you're inventing people, that is a fabulous feeling that I didn't know about because I wrote nonfiction. But when you write fiction, it's like God. It's, it's like you're God. You are creating people. And then you watch them kind of run around and do their thing, you know. And, you know, it is really strange. I'd always heard that, but I never believed one word of it but it does happen. And then you get into this creation thing, you know, well, if I could create that character, I can create another one <laughs> and you go on and on kind of thing. So it makes you feel very powerful? Uh, powerful and humble because once you create these creatures, they do have a little tendency to do what they're gonna do, what they want, not what you impose on them necessarily. You know, it's like they're being true to themselves. So you invite, you invent this person, but then the person, mm -hmm you know, is true to himself or herself and just does what he's gonna do. So you develop the character and then the character has to behave according to the character you've created. So they, so then they kind of take off on their own. Yeah, they take right? off on their own. And, yeah. talk, and talk back to you, is that it? Yeah, <laughs> they don't talk back to me. I won't let them, but no, no, but they do. And they are either in character or out of character. And if they follow their character, they're in character. But if they're out of character, then they do something that you wouldn't expect them to do. So, yeah. but you don't but, sit there and command them. Yeah. Do you get to feel like you're, you're out of control? <laughs> After a while? <laughs> oh man, I'm telling you. Well, no, but you have uh, b better times with some characters than, than others, you know, in terms of what they're doing, yeah. And you like, like some characters more than others, obviously? Yeah, well, I liked Severine a lot when she was a little girl mm -hmm. because she was bright and intelligent and just, I don't know, I just really had affection for her when she was a little girl. When she got a bit older, um, she kind of, rubbed me the wrong way sometimes. And I thought she was really stupid. <laughs> but that's the point, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, she grew up, you know. So tell one, tell one story that you told me. You were on, a, you were on another um, webinar and someone sort of attacked you over your topic. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, there was a woman who just hated Severine. And she said, I don't call you. I was calling Severine an ordinary woman in or extraordinary times, which I think that she was. And she said, I don't see anything uh, 
I think she got it wrong too. She, she said, I don't see anything extraordinary about uh, Severine and I don't know why you'd want to waste your time on a character like her. She's not a good person and she didn't do good things and therefore she, could, she shouldn't exist. I mean, that was the gist of it. And so well, I fortunately said, well, she wasn't the author. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, wait a minute, just could you just maybe consider that this person, um, you know, she was not always black and white. She did some things that were good and some things that weren't so good and, you know, and give her a break, you know? No, 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 there was no, no compromise. She was really flipped out about Severina. <laughs> well, I'm just curious if there's anyone else out there that had a similar uh, experience or similar feelings about that character. About Severine? Oh. Yeah. Anybody out there want to speak up? Of course, not everybody's read the book yet. No, they're, just gonna have to go, book. they're just going to have to go read the book. Yeah, you got to read the book first. I have another question. <laughs> OK. OK, Judy, yes. go ahead. Thank you. Um, Harriet, I'd like to know if uh, you have another standalone in the works or what you're working on now. Oh, good question. Well, I finished this book and I was so proud of finishing this book and I was so proud of getting it out that, uh, and then I had to promote it. And so I've been concentrating on that and hoping that there's gonna be a little thought in my mind for a, a next uh, project. Um, and I will know when it comes because when it comes, it's really strong and there's no doubt about it, but it hasn't come in yet. I keep hoping. <laughs> I'll let you know when it does. It's true. Yeah. You know, I find it really interesting that you and Kara Black, okay, both took a real turn from the usual about the same time to write different, different stories, very different yeah. stories, yeah. but both with women as protagonists mm -hmm. um, and both about World War II, about the same period of time. Yeah, yeah that was interesting. It's and they and both your books came out about the same time. Hers is three hours in Paris, and it's a, it's about an American woman, not about a French yeah. woman. So it's right. they're I mean they're very different books. They're different. Okay, books. I, I read her book. I liked it. I thought it was good. Her three hours. In Paris. But it was it was really different. It was also she digressed from her usual, uh, you know, and and you both wrote about the same period of time. So it was really interesting to me. And I read them both at about the same time. So all right. I remember you sent me a uh, you were it was in the summer and you said this was a great uh, beach read. <laughs> remember? Yeah, 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 I, definitely. So I was happy that I gave you some pleasure for an afternoon on the beach. So where's a good place to get your book? OK, you can get it um, on Amazon, of course. And you can get it in Paris at the Red Wheelbarrow or Galliani's. Mm -hmm. And I would I, say- I love that, it at the Red Wheelbarrow. We need to support Penelope. Yeah, we need to support. <laughs> and yeah, Penelope and Galliani's is a very nice store too. I've always liked it too. Um, but Penelope, of course, is different because she's a- And, she's, and she's open these days. Yeah, and she's open. So is Galliani's. Yeah. Uh, W.H. Smith has had the book. It only got, it had two copies and he sold them both. And now they're going to close for um, some kind of work or something. So I wouldn't recommend Patty that. Patty put uh, the Red Wheelbarrow uh, link in the chat okay. so that people can. People in right. Paris. Right. 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 And, and for Paris. those of you who don't, I was just going to say for those of people who don't know, the Red Wheelbarrow is a bookstore that had been here for a long time, run by Penelope Fletcher on Rue Saint Paul, and then it closed for a long time. And then Penelope reopened it on Rue de Medicis uh, across from the Luxembourg Gardens about what, a year and a half, two years yeah. ago, year and a half ago, something yeah. like that. And it seems to be doing very well. Oh, and so we- It's a fantastic we, location, yeah. Location, but we need yeah. to really, we need to do whatever we can to support, you know, support uh, the independent bookstore. Yes, absolutely. Now, I was going to just say something. Um, yeah, she's put up Amazon, too. Um, if you do buy this book and read it and like it and want to put a review on Amazon, if you bought it there, because you can't otherwise, and uh, if you bought it at uh, the Red Wheelbarrow, you can still write a review for Goodreads. They don't 
require anything of you. You just go in there and write a review. You just find my book, Final Transgression on Goodreads, and then write a review. So, oh, in other words, if you, on Amazon, you have to have gotten the book from them in order to be able to submit a review. Yeah, unfortunately, I've okay. tried. Well, it makes sense. Yeah, I've tried to review books uh, for other people on, on Amazon, and I, they won't let me do it because I haven't spent more than fifty uh, dollars or something <laughs> over the past. I don't know what. I mean, it's ridiculous. But I just was going to say that. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. uh, and the reason I say that is in these times of COVID, the only, oh, Penny, yes, Penny wrote a great review on Goodreads. Penny Lundquist, who's here, yeah. Um, and those reviews count, you know, they're important. Yeah, they're yeah. Really important. So, to get the book. Okay, so on. everybody's gotta go out, read the book, and then do the review. Yay, okay, right. but that's nice, okay. Well, listen, Does anybody I, have any other questions for Harriet? I bet you're tired. I bet you all want to go eat. Although it's 7.30 here. I don't know what time it is where you all are from. Maybe noon or something. Oh, but they're, hey, some of these, a lot of these people are in California. It's early oh for them. Oh, my goodness. Oh. They're just starting their day. They're starting your day just when we're ending ours. Yeah. Right, right. Well, it's so nice. Um, yeah. Well, Harriet, thank you so, so, so much for being here. It's really, it's always a pleasure. You're always a delight. I thank love your you. stories. And uh, the book was wonderful. So, you know, for everybody out there. Now, the way this can work, we can, we can all hang in. You can put it on um, gallery view and you can unmike yourselves and, and talk to each other. Um, you can also feel free to ask me questions if you want. And we're, we're gonna be here for another 30 minutes. And then this is being recorded. We are gonna make it available. Okay. So you can always send your friends to watch it if you like. Okay, well, Adrian, I wanna thank you so much. I'm going to have to leave because, um, because I have to leave. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, go, see, go feed Philippe. Yeah, yeah, that poor guy. He's, he's suffered long and hard over this book. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I just wanted to say it was so uh, nice to see familiar faces and um, people I don't know. And I really enjoyed telling you about my book and hope you'll enjoy reading it. And Adrian, you are phenomenal. You Thank just, you, darling. You, Thank you. you. I think I feel the same way. It's been a pleasure knowing you all these years. Yeah. It's and, been uh, and we'll just, hey, I, I'm ready. Next book. Okay. Let me know when your okay. next book is out. We'll do I'll it think again. About Okay, I'll let you know the minute okay. I get it. Okay. Bye, Harry. Thank you. Everybody okay. can say thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye. Okay, bye, honey. Bye. Bye, Patty. Thank Adrian, you. where will the um, recording be? How can we locate it? Well, you're going to have to read the Nouvelle Lettre. And <laughs> in, the, in my, in my I newsletter, do. I'll, I'll uh, publish the link. It will probably come out tomorrow afternoon because I've got an early train and um, I'm going to be doing this on the train. Yay for the TGV with, uh, you know, with Wi-Fi and the plug and all that. So I'll be pulling all this together tomorrow. Okay. And then you'll, you'll get the recording. As long as I don't screw it up, which I have done before, I have to make sure that the, <laughs> Patty's doing backup for me, thank goodness, because... You know, I'm, I'm not exactly the technical genius here, that's for sure. <laughs> Any other questions out there? Anybody want to say anything? Oh, this is the quietest group ever. Ella's got her hand up. <laughs> okay. Just, okay, Ella. Come on, Ella. Well, um, I'm, I'm counting the hours until you arrive and uh, looking forward to seeing you as well, Patty. Um, I, I wanted to ask Harriet, uh, she made a comment about her characters and some were just deciding on what they were gonna do and how the population at that time was like, they were either for or against and so on and so forth. And I'm just wondering what correlation could one draw from that era to what has gone on, especially in the United States and maybe even globally about uh, the different political stances and uh, everything from COVID to 
you you know climate change to you name it what what can we learn from that previous generation that previous experience and apply it to today um i have no idea how harriet would answer that but it seems to me we haven't learned anything at all <laughs> yeah. Yeah. anybody want to answer that question hmm. Hmm. I mean, and I don't think there's any any answer necessary, but that's just always what I'm kind of thinking about. It's it's like you know we we've seen that uh, I don't know if it's a meme or what, but you know first they came for the Jews, then they came for the handicap, and then the Jehovah's Witness, and then the Gypsies, and then they you know and then nobody else was around, and then they came for me, and so uh, you know. I just, I, I just think that we have to learn from history and especially in the last few years, uh, what's gone on in America, Black Lives Matter, uh, uh, mask versus no mask, you know, what can, what can we learn from previous generations? Ellen, we can learn a lot, but I'm not sure that a lot of those people actually know the history. I'm not sure they were taught the history or really know it, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a personal opinion, you know, of the dumbing down of America. Um, and uh, and if they were born after World War II. Yeah, which is why some of us live outside of America. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so one of the things I heard was that young, young people are reading more, children are reading more. So, I mean, we have that beautiful book by Anne Frank that you know is really good for i was just wondering are there any other books for young people to feel what you feel reading anne frank's diary and then i'm not even sure if there's some school districts that have banned it because they seem to ban all books now for whatever stupid reasons but the you know that now that the world war ii the last of the world war ii soldiers are dying i'm really concerned about keeping the stories alive um, for the new next generations, because like you said, I mean, are we learning anything? There are people who still wanna run off to war. We have this unbelievable military budget for what, you know? And so I, I, I can't wait to read this book. I just, I don't, I'm not around children a lot. So I don't know what's being taught in the schools to keep World War II alive, but I, I just, I feel like before they all die off, my God, we got to get their stories and um, and and just keep keep this alive in our memory. Did you ever read Sarah's Key by Tatiana Duronet? I don't think so. I think I may have bought it and not read it. So I'll well, well then take it out and read it. It was it was also made into a movie with Chris, Kristen uh, Scott Thomas. Mm -hmm. Uh, it takes place on my street, believe it or not, just by happenstance. Um, but it's a very moving novel about um, the Val the Valdive Roundup, and uh, in particular one family and you know a young girl who locked her brother in a closet when they came to round them up, and he got left in the closet. And it, it's a it's a really moving story about that time. Mm -hmm. so I highly recommend that. And the movie was wonderful. Also, you can just yeah. see it as a movie. Yeah. And I, Thank you. And I'm I'm just not sure what all America is teaching history wise about anything because if you look at America's history, it's kind of bleak. So. I don't know. I, I would I would hope that my granddaughters will learn a little bit more globally, but I think that the next generations will be much more inquisitive. I hope so. I don't get the impression, Ellen, that they're teaching much of anything, quite honestly, but you know. That's true. So it's incumbent upon us that have a little bit of insight thanks to programs like this to perhaps uh, put forth a, a few questions and ask them. Um, uh, I, I don't know that my oldest granddaughter is really aware of, 
what took place with the Native Americans in her state of Minnesota uh, or, or the surrounding areas. And, uh, and then you go, you go further south and what took place and still takes place uh, and the reason that we have the Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, protest necessary. So uh, it maybe it's just incumbent upon all of us. We may not be, we may not be like the, you know, as talented as the author to go and research and so forth, but just, you know, uh, put forth some sort of question to the next generation of what is, what are, what are you learning in school? And then, you know, what, this is what I learned. What do you think about that? Uh, Adrian, I'll, I'll pass on just a little bit. My uh, almost 16 year old granddaughter in the Boston area, cause I've asked her what's going on in history class. And they pretty much gloss over a great deal of history and for extra credit, if a student wants to do a report on World War II. That's not to say it's not presented, but there's so much that they have to get through, teachers do, in a limited amount of time. And, uh, and it's a big subject. And it's a huge subject. And uh, well, I can remember growing up, I'm dating myself, in the 50s, there there really wasn't much of anything talked about the word Holocaust. Are you kidding? That was never mentioned, of course, you know, so. Well, the U.S. kind of ignored that until they couldn't any longer, too. That is correct. I, I mean, quite honestly, it wasn't like they came to the rescue very quickly. Right? Yes. It's so much... It's so much a matter of the teacher. Some teachers will bring things to a classroom, but there is not an equal education throughout the United States by any means. It depends on the school, it depends on the teachers, and it is unfortunate. I have a 15-year-old grandson who just finished reading Night by Elie Wiesel, and mm. I'm, not, I'm not sure if he was assigned it or decided to explore that era on his own. I need to talk with him about it. And he's in Oakland, California. So yeah, it could yeah, it could just depend on the teacher itself. You know, in France, the educational system is universal to the entire state. So, you know, every child in a particular class is supposed to be learning the same material on the same day throughout the country. Now, I don't know if that's really true or not, but that's the premise. And so, and it's, so it's highly, uh, at least consistent, and it is very academic. There's a lot about the French uh, education system that I don't necessarily agree with, okay? They do a lot of things that we as Americans would never think of doing, okay? Um, but it is highly academic, academic, and they do really pump a lot of information into those kids. Uh, and I would have to say that they get a much better, uh, a much better, deeper education in his history, of course, which is really important in France. So they probably know more about the United States than the United than the Americans know about the United States, mm -hmm. and certainly what Americans might know about France, that's for sure. <laughs> I would, but, I would add. My children were born here and they're now 22 and they recently have had discussions and they they're, they said, I'm so glad you didn't move back to the US at a certain point. It was a possibility at one point in their lives. And they've gotten a wonderful education, you know, the, the celebrated French culture générale. But I've also tried to balance that with all the American positive stuff and the creativity and the brainstorming and the communications marketing skills in America. I also took my daughter to Amsterdam to Anne Frank's house when she was about the same age as Anne Frank. And she's never, ever forgotten that. So that was one of those kind of, you get it right as a mom, that was a beautiful moment. And the only other thing I'd want to add is right now, I'm just so emotional the past few years, what all of us who are on Facebook have seen 
it's, it, I've gotten so emotional about the polarization and the meanness and the, we talk about repeating history or not, but the number, I don't like to get political on Facebook, but the number of people that have written hideous things or people write about how they unfriended people. So I think there's, there's just, Facebook has kind of amplified what's been happening in American culture. I'm not convinced at a other recent time in American history, we saw that level of polarization. And I think we know some of the reasons why, but um, I'm hoping we're getting back to some more normal times. And at least there were a lot of posts on Facebook saying, hey, if we don't agree, can we still be civilized or that kind of thing, you know? Well, we finally have a president who's really trying, making, making a huge effort for bipartisan politics. Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. He, whether he can accomplish it or not is something else, but you know, every other word out of their mouths, whether it's uh, Jen Psaki you know, in a press conference or whoever talking about doing things together and not uh and not separating the republicans from the democrats it's just we're we're in it as a unit together period so at least we have that <clears throat> that doesn't Absolutely. mean there's yeah it, you know that doesn't mean that undercurrent is still not out there because they are i mean we're watching the impeachment started the impeachment proceedings started today right or they will start today. I don't think that's a good thing necessarily. Oh I, think, I think it's a waste of time. It's on right now. Yeah, they're, they're making the arguments. Well, I don't care to look at it, but it's a, it's a waste of time, um, a total waste of time. And this is what part of what polarizes our country. Um, you know, let's forget about Trump, it's behind us. Why do we need to seek revenge? A lot of this trial is political. So let's face it, let's tell the truth. Oh, I don't know. Well, that's what they're trying to sweep it under the rug. They'd like to forget it. They'd like to move on. Let's face it, right? But, right. but then there's no accountability. I know no one stormed the White House since the British soldiers burned it down in the early 1800s. It's kind of a big deal. Well, it is a big deal. But let's also discuss Portland and some of the Blacks um, basically taking over on, um, uh, what do you call, uh, you know, looting stores and that. And um, that was a huge thing, basically. And that is not talked about, and it should be. I think that I think that's been discussed, um, and but I think those are the minority. Just like when the yellow the yellow jackets, as we would call them in Paris, there was a group yeah. out there at the end, you know, and they got on board, and whoever, whatever um, group they were from, and they just, you know, they looted and broke windows and so forth. So I just, but I think that was not the majority in Portland. Uh, the majority in Portland were out. Um, to protest something else. And that was um, some guilty kinds of things on the part of the police at that point. Um, it was a, bi it was a by pro byproduct. I would just but say- you're right, it happened here in France. I would just say that I think that the, that the United States, the entire country, the, tech, the, 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 the land itself really needs to be saged because the karma is so bad. It uh, was founded on genocide of the Native Americans, built on slavery. And within our lifetime, some of you are younger than me, but in the, you know, modern time, the last 75 plus years, uh, war has been the primary economic engine. And so although I absolutely uh, believe in um, capitalism. I think, unfortunately, America has lost its direction, it doesn't have a good uh, history, and it's lost uh, the, the capitalism has just turned to uh, cannibalism. So if somebody could get a big swatch of sage and just, you know, sage the entire country and see the shiny sea, I think that one might be a good thing. <laughs> I think some, you know, in France, you know, you have the same, some of the same problems with the um, Muslims, with the Arabs. So that's a big issue too, 
you know? Yeah, that's true. Debbie, you would really, really appreciate Michael Porter of Harvard Business School. Michael Porter and uh, Catherine Gale have teamed up to uh, speak about the duopoly of the American political system. And all you have to do, and I'll, I'll try to put it in the chat, but it's the American political system, unfortunately, was when the founding fathers created it, they didn't have a lot of examples. So they used something that worked at the time, but 200 plus years later. And I think you, would, you will really, really, you'll understand and appreciate how unfortunately this system is just, it's, it's a pendulum. It just, it, so nothing really done between the two political parties. But if you Google Michael Porter, Catherine Gale, and I'll put it in the chat, and uh, you'll really enjoy and appreciate the insights to that and how we need to, I, I say we, but I mean America needs to just kind of like look at how to make some very small changes without changing the American constitution. I am listening to the audio book right now by Barack Obama, The Promised Land, and um, it's in his voice. And it's, and it's hours and hours and hours and hours, okay, because it's huge. And it's a completely detailed account of his entire, you know, eight years in the White House and everything he went through to get all the various bills and initiatives accomplished, which was a major task because he was always battling the Republican House and Senate. And um, uh, it, it's really a, it's an eye opener. I mean, and it's, it's detailed, it's political, but, and he talks about all the characters. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. So I must say, I highly recommend it, but be prepared to get, <laughs> go deep. I have that on my coffee table. You know, you have to realize you have to be ingrained in the system. And you have two political parties, yes, you know, that can't seem to get along, um, but we're, we're not ready to go towards socialism, uh, which the Democrats seem to be veering towards socialism. Um, and we're just, we're not there, we can't do it. And, um, you know, some of the things you never hear about, like those riots in Portland, Kamala Harris actually paid to get some of those people out. Um, so we're starting to see, you need to see some, what it feels like over here for some of us, um, that sense of, you know, entitlement, um, making reparations. Uh, I wasn't alive when this happened. I wasn't alive when slavery was taking place. So I don't see why I need to make reparations. Again, you have a lot of people like myself that worked 40 years. And there are also other people who, um, various races, that they feel entitled. There's a sense of entitlement. And that's what I think splits the country. A lot of that stuff splits the country. Um, Black Lives Matter is a very uh, violent. Debbie, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you that um, the Democrats, okay, who you think are going towards a, in a socialist direction, aren't even close to that idea. We live in a socialist democracy in France, and this is closer, okay? It is a socialist democracy, so it's closer to a socialist idea. And what the Democrats are trying to do is scratch on the surface. They don't even, they're not even, they're so far removed from the true idea of it, it's not even funny. And they're just trying to inch it over so that more people have, okay, the kinds of rights not privileges that we have in France, because health care is a right, not a privilege in France. Quality education is a right, not a privilege in France. And you know, capitalists coming to France, like all of us Americans, have to kind. Of, we have to get used to this idea that you know the wealth is spread, that we're going to pay a certain higher level of taxation in order to have all these benefits. 
And then we live with all these benefits and we go, whoa, why don't they understand this in the United States? I don't understand why they can't get their head around it, quite honestly, because we're living in, in the world that's benefiting from it. And it's not a perfect world. There are a lot of things about what happens here in France that I would like to see be a little more capitalist, you know, which is why I like Macron because he's more of a centrist and he's trying to get things a little more economically balanced. But um, the US is so far right at this point that they can't even see the forest for the trees. And so, you know, all I can say is, I, I, that's why so many people are moving over to this side of the planet where it is more socialist, because all of Europe, all of Europe is a socialist democracy in effect. And it, and it actually works really well. So I don't just don't know why Americans are so afraid of it. Does anybody else have, have any other people living here? I see Janet is on. I don't know if you're listening, Janet Holstrand. Thank uh, you, are, thank you, thank you, thank you, Adrian, for saying it just as it is. I appreciate it. I think we also don't talk enough in this country, in the US, about corporate socialism. The money that is funneled to the richest companies, to the richest farmers, the millionaire farmers in the Midwest who are anti-welfare, but when they get their millions of in subsidies, they'll be quiet. And the corporate socialism is a massive problem because it's on the backs of the workers all the money, these hardworking Americans, it gets funneled to the rich. And that is not talked about. Bernie Sanders talked about it. He talks about it a lot. But corporate socialism is eating up billions of hardworking American tax dollars. And that needs to be addressed. And the Republicans are absolutely silent on it. They just talk about socialism as a communist thing, but they're not facing the facts. They're just giving it a bad name rather than understanding what it really means. Because I don't think the average American understands what the word means even, no. or how it plays out, or how and it I, can actually affect everyone's lives better. I agree with that completely, Well, um, and I would just say, Debbie and um, Suzanne, that uh, what I put in the chat, I'm sorry I didn't get the link in there, but um, unfortunately the American political um, situation, political situation itself is just a duopoly. And so it cannot have uh, competition because it's just the two parties. And Michael Porter, who is the guru of uh, marketing out of Harvard, and Catherine Gale, a, a brilliant business owner, they really, this program that they have on YouTube is so helpful in understanding just the yin and yang of the American political system. And the Democrats are not perfect and nor are the Republicans, but the problem is it's just the two of them. And with that- And it's just gonna swing back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And uh, RBG said right. the pendulum of politics, and it does not have to be that way. And I would just encourage everyone to spend an hour with these two highly intelligent people that uh, explain it, the changes that can be made without changing the, having to change the Constitution. Yeah, and I've always voted for the best candidate, I don't care if he's a Republican or Democrat, you can't vote by party because it just creates more polarization. Just vote for the best person. And that and that somehow has changed in the past 10 well, or 15 well, years. Obama actually explains how polarization happened okay. through, in the book, which is amazing. And it pretty much started with Ronald Reagan. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, but, yeah. Adrian, you're, you're right, but it also happens because of how our political system is in that you are not allowed to vote from two uh, different parties at different times. Unlike well, right, you, you, have to declare, you have to declare your allegiance. Exactly. Right. So I might really 
candidate, a libertarian candidate for one role and a Republican candidate for another. But when I get to the final poll, I have to declare a party where in France, right. you, it's the process of elimination. And that is what ironically, both Catherine Gale and Michael Porter talk about let's look at how we could do something more like this because no party is perfect obviously well everybody it is now 759 so we have one minute left if anyone would like to add anything to this conversation or to harriet's conversation speak now or forever hold your peace <laughs> No, everybody's, so thank you all for being here tonight, today, tonight. And we will be back in a month's time on the second Tuesday of the month. Read the Nouvelle Lettre for more information about what's coming up. And um, I assume we're gonna be on Zoom because we still can't be, I don't think we're gonna be able to be live. So everybody stay safe, stay well and uh, happy. Thank you all. Good night. Goodbye. Au revoir. Au revoir.